Bob Pasnow, I'm a professor of philosophy and director of the Center for Western Civilization, Sean Collins. Quite a few of you, I suppose, know me by now. I appreciate your support of our program. Uh, as, as probably most all of you know, the Center for Western Civilization, Thought and Policy, what we're all about is promoting uh, intellectual diversity on the Boulder campus. And, uh, so we're interested in um, fostering debates of all kinds. We uh, did one on immigration this past fall that I'm sure some of you heard. Uh, we've got a list of our upcoming events here on the board. Uh, notice in particular on March 16th, we're doing an event on gun control, um, featuring two prominent um, uh, uh, proponents of both sides of that debate. We're going to two different sides. Uh, we are, uh, on April 3rd, hosting uh, a conversation between Jerome Skinner. She's a fellow at the Hoover Institution and a professor at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, between her and Christopher Hill, former ambassador to Iraq and currently the dean of the Corbell School of International Studies down at U. Uh, that should be quite a lot of the occasion. That's on April 3rd. Um, on April 5th, um, Rod Dreher is going to be here, uh, senior editor at the American Conservative. Uh, he'll be talking about the future of religious conservatism in post-Christian America. Uh, on April 13th, we're going to have another one of our, our dialogue, uh, debate-style events um, on public lands. Uh, who should own them? Should be another lively event. And that's in connection with the conference on world affairs. Um, of course, all of that's available on our website, and if you're not on our email list, you can easily get on our email list and visit our website. And you can find the website just by Googling CWCTP or something like that. Uh, some of these events, like this one, we ask people to register in advance. If you don't register in advance, we'll still let you in the door, but that's a good way for us to sort of figure out how many people are going to come and to make uh, provisions accordingly. So, uh, if you're thinking of coming to one of our events, especially one of the big, bigger forums, um, look to see whether we're asking you to register. That's been very helpful to us. Let me now uh, introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, many of you will admit Francis Beckwith has been here since uh, August. He's um, regularly professor of philosophy and of church state studies at Baylor University. And he's here, of course, this year as the fourth of our visiting scholars in conservative thought and policy. Uh, he's been teaching philosophy courses here at CU. He's teaching a political science course as well as a philosophy course in the spring. Uh, he's the author most recently of the book Taking Rights Seriously, uh, Law, Politics, and the Reasonableness of Faith. Uh, which in 2016 won the American Academy of Religion Award. Uh, today's topic could hardly be more timely. Uh, I think, you know, whether you're just voted in your first election or if you've been voting in lots and lots of elections over the years, you're looking to Washington right now and thinking, wow, I've never seen anything like that before. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm, whether, you know, whatever our level of enthusiasm, I'm sure we're all asking ourselves, is this the future of conservatism uh, in America? So, um, let me turn things over to Professor Beckwith and if you try to answer that question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a podium guy, so I need that for my text, but... Um, Thank you so much uh, for coming. I'm, I'm honored at the, the turnout. Uh, uh, I actually was watching um, uh, the Apprentice uh, Supreme Court edition right before, uh, before I got here. Well, we should, have, we should have known that something was up. The Cavaliers captured the NBA championship. The Cubs won the World Series. The UK voted to leave the EU and Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize in Literature. <laughs> 2016 was not an ordinary year. After the networks declared on the morning of November 9th that Donald J. Trump will become the 45th President of the United States, the words of Nobel's latest laureate came to mind. Something's happening here and you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? Like most of those in the chattering classes, I was caught completely off guard by the Trump victory. 
Almost everyone I knew, including many self-identified conservatives, were not supporting Trump. They argued, as I have argued in several places, that there were strong reasons not to cast one's vote for Trump or, or Hillary Clinton, for that matter. We thought that given Trump's private and public indiscretions, his impulsiveness and unpredictability, and not to mention his not-so-delicate comments about immigration, that his election would doom the Republican Party as well as the country. But the fact is that virtually none of us thought we would have to worry about the country, since we also thought that he was unelectable. Boy, were we wrong. Like Dylan's Mr. Jones, we had no idea what was happening here. My friends, mostly other professors, and I exist in the cultural equivalent of a guarded and gated community, largely insulated from the everyday lives of most working class Americans, the ones whose votes put Trump over the top in Pennsylvania, Iowa, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin. They are the ones that the then Senator Barack Obama spoke of in 2008 while he was privately addressing a group of donors in San Francisco. Quote, you go up into these small towns in Pennsylvania and like a lot of small towns in the Midwest, the jobs have been gone now for 25 years and nothing's replaced them. And they fell through the Clinton administration and the Bush administration and each successive administration has said that somehow these communities are going to regenerate and they have not. And it's not surprising then they get, they get bitter. They cling to guns or religion or antipathy toward people who aren't like them or anti-immigrant sentiment or anti-trade sentiment as a way to explain their frustrations, unquote. Despite these comments, Obama nevertheless won a sizable portion of these bitter clingers. They apparently were willing to give the charming and intelligent senator from Illinois the benefit of the doubt if it meant better prospects for them and their families. But after eight years, it didn't turn out that way. They not only became worse off, their concerns about immigration, trade policy, police safety, national security, religious liberty were uncharitably redescribed by many in our opinion shaping institutions as mere visceral expressions of some deeper prejudices. The only candidate that seemed to address these concerns and to take them seriously was Donald Trump. Sure, he was bombastic, sometimes inarticulate, and used language that was often off-putting, unnecessarily abrasive, and jarringly offensive. But who else were these citizens going to turn to? Hillary Clinton? Remember, she's the one who said this about half of Trump's supporters in September. You know, quote, to just be grossly generalistic, you could put half of Trump's supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables, unquote. By publicly condemning Trump's bitter clingers to the basket of deplorables and delighting in the laughter that followed, Clinton and her adoring audience unwittingly sealed their fate. Not only that, thanks to WikiLeaks, the deplorables also got a peek behind the curtain. What they saw were elites, largely from the same schools, the same neighborhoods, with the same income levels, and with all the same friends, using their connections and influence to give Clinton what seemed to ordinary folks to be an unfair advantage. When one sees those who often speak eloquently of social justice and transparency gaming the system for their friends, while calling you and your neighbors deplorables, indignation seems to be the appropriate emotional response. Like Bill Foster, Michael Douglas's character in 1993 movie Falling Down, these voters were asking themselves, I'm the bad guy? How did that happen? Although I was an outspoken critic of Trump during both the primaries and the general election, and I received my share of hate email, uh, which I've kept. I have a special folder on my hard drive uh, just for that. I was willing to exercise the virtue of hope on November 9th. In fact, I penned these very words in a column published that day, quote, perhaps the president-elect's awareness of the awesome responsibility of the Oval Office, combined with the selection of excellent people in positions of leadership and counsel in his administration, will result in a President Trump less given to the undisciplined exercise of what Thomas Aquinas called the concupiscible and irascible appetites. I know it's only been less than two weeks since the inauguration, but this conservative is deeply confused by what I'm hearing from both the new administration and its critics. Here are a few examples of what has led to my confusion. First, I do not understand why it matters whether one's inauguration had a larger attendance than one's predecessors, especially when your predecessor was the first African-American elected to the presidency in the history of the United States. 
a more rhetorically adept White House would have responded to the different numbers with wit and charm. For example, if I were President Trump's press secretary, I would have responded with a query taken out of the playbook of William F. Buckley Jr. And I'm going to try, for those who remember Buckley, you'll see whether I, this impression is good. Uh, 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 which newspaper uh, ha has the largest circulation, the National Enquirer or the New York Times? Uh, 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 which is the better paper? That, that's the way I think they should have handled that. That is, um, sheer numbers actually has nothing to do with, with quality. Uh, second, I'm not sure, so I'm going to go to the other side now. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure what's so wrong with saying America first. I understand that the phrase was originally used by a collection of right-wing and left-wing citizens, the America First Committee, who were against the U.S. entry uh, into what would eventually become the Second World War, and among its members included the pilot Charles Lindbergh, whose anti-Semitism was well known. But I find America first no more offensive than the term progressive, which we today do not rightfully saddle with the beliefs and deeds of the Bolsheviks, eugenicists, or scientific racialists who move freely in progressive circles in the first decades of the 20th century. When I heard America first in President Trump's inaugural address, I thought of it as no different than saying charity begins at home or I love my parents much more than the elderly couple that runs a general store down the street. I didn't take it to mean that caring for those closest to oneself and about whom one has a special responsibility is in competition with less particular obligations we have to others as such. In fact, it seems to me if you don't practice charity at home, you will not develop the virtues that allow you to practice it elsewhere. My sense is that the so-called deplorables probably heard it that way too. I am sure others heard it quite differently, probably along the lines of G.K. Chesterton's quip about excessive patriotism. My country right or wrong is like saying my mother drunk or sober. <laughs> and yet, if you look around American college campuses, immigrant students are rightly encouraged to not shrink from expressing their ethnic identities that spring from their countries of origin to think of themselves as having something important to contribute to the common fund of the American experience, that their absence from our nation would in some way diminish its excellence and greatness. If there is any truth in that, and I have no doubt that there is, isn't that a way to say that one ought to put America first? Or as President Trump put in his inaugural address, quote, it is time to remember that old wisdom our soldiers will never forget that whether we are black or brown or white, we all bleed the same red blood, we all enjoy the same glorious freedoms, and we all salute the same great American flag." Unquote. Third, there has been much talk about how President Trump seems to have rejected the traditions that have been for generations embedded in the American presidency, and I am afraid to report that there is something to that. Uh, take, for example, the executive order on extreme vetting that was issued at 5.30 p.m. last Friday. In the past, when a president wanted to create a policy that would bring swift changes that had the potential to affect tens of thousands of citizens, he would first meet privately with the heads of the relevant administrative agencies, consult experts, seek advice from members of Congress, and then give a nationally televised speech in which he sp explains in careful and respectful language the change in policy and how it may impact the life of the nation. Even if you found yourself disagreeing with the president, you would at least feel that, you, that he had given you reasons that were the consequence of thoughtful deliberation. Unfortunately, President Trump didn't do that, and his critics are right in saying that the rollout for the executive order seemed not only incompetent but insensitive to the thousands of U.S. citizens and permanent residents who were traveling abroad the moment the order was issued. Another example. We expect from our leaders that they act as if the rules are more important than the outcome. That is, one may, for instance, think that sanctuary cities are a bad idea, that gov local government should not go out of their way to not assist the federal government in its discovery and deportation of illegal immigrants. As you see it, that's your ideal outcome. But we live in a country of divided governments and a separation of powers, which means that the federal government cannot commandeer the police powers of local governments to achieve its ends, no matter how noble or justified. For decades, conservatives 
committed to the principles of federalism that grounded this belief, often complained, and rightfully, that federal administrative agencies, by their regulations, sometimes violated those principles. So, for example, according to many conservatives, the Obama administration overreacted, or overreached, excuse me, when its Office of Civil Rights in the Department of Education, through powers given to it by Title IX, threatened to initiate procedures to withdraw federal funding to any private or public school receiving such funds if it did not follow the agency's guidance. In one of his recent executive orders, President Trump has issued a similar threat to sanctuary cities if their state governments do not accept the administration's partnership agreement. As a consequence, many progressives have discovered federalism, <laughs> eloquently arguing that we live in a country of divided governments and a separation of powers, that the chief executive of the federal government may not commandeer the powers of state governments, even if the ends of such commandeering may be just. For the rules are more important than the outcomes, and I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, so um, my own view is that I think that it, it's in fact that Trump's executive order in fact is unconstitutional. Uh, we'll see. Uh, so I'm really confused. I have my theories as to how we got to this strange place in American politics and what it pertains to the future of conservatism. So what I want to do in my remaining time here is to provide a brief overview of American conservatism, its recent history, and conclude with a few words about its future. However, here I defer to the authority of that great philosopher Yogi Berra. It's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. So everything I say this evening should be taken with a grain of salt. America is changing at breakneck speed. It seems like only yesterday that Republicans were accusing Democrats of having nefarious associations with the Russians, and the State Department was overwhelmed with civil servants whose sympathies ran closer to Moscow than to Washington. Where are Richard Nixon and Alger Hiss when you need them? <laughs> so what is conservatism? American conservatism is very difficult to define since its differing manifestations arise historically as reactions against specific cultural and political events, trends, and movements. Is my, <laughs> my iTunes is playing. It is, Bob, it is Bob Dylan. It is actually, how about that? It's, now if you don't believe in the supernatural, that should convince you right there, right? Um, so um, um, conservatism is very difficult to define. It comes under different manifestations. It, historically, conservatism has uh, really resulted from reactions about specific cultural and political events, trends, and movements. For this reason, under the umbrella of conservatism, one can find a diversity of sometimes contrary points of view and policy prescriptions. In some ways, American conservatism is like a church consisting of parishioners who share a creed about which they are conspicuously unaware until they discover a heretic within their midst. <laughs> it is then and only then that they begin offering reasons and constructing arguments for what they had believed was just common sense until the arrival of the heretic. This is why many writers often refer to conservatism as a kind of pre-analytic respect for the givenness of the proper ends of human nature that is expressed in an enduring moral order sustained and inculcated by custom and convention in continuity with the generations that preceded us and represent a reservoir of inherited wisdom that no one age could have ever created by itself. As Russell Kirk put it, quote, in essence, the conservative person is simply one who finds the permanent things more pleasing than chaos and old night. A person's historic continuity of experience says the conservative, offers a guide to policy far better than the abstract designs of coffeehouse philosophers." Unquote. Or I might, I'd add TED Talk social scientists, <laughs> which actually I enjoy watching, by the way. So it's, uh... Consequently, in order to understand conservatism and to properly explore the topic of this evening, the future of conservatism, we have to ask ourselves how well this devotion to both the permanent things and in our inherited traditions has been expressed in our politics over the past five decades in four different areas of common concern to which conservatives have typically gravitated. And they are constitutional law, economics, national defense, and public morality. In each area, conservatives have made their presence known with differing, differing degrees of success and failure. I'm going to 
grab some water. Excuse me. First, judicial conservatism. Judicial conservatism, sometimes called originalism, is a reaction against a way of reading statutes and constitution that seems to bypass the ordinary avenues of representative government. Virtually unknown as an identifiable judicial philosophy just 50 years ago, it has become such an important concept that whenever, by the way, we did have somebody appointed today to the U.S. Supreme Court, um, Neil Gorish, who happens to be a resident of North Boulder, Colorado. I don't know if you, uh, you know that. Um, by the way, that's what I was referring to earlier as the Prentice Supreme Court edition. I don't know if... Uh, virtually unknown as, as an identifiable judicial philosophy just 50 years ago, it has become such an important concept that whenever a president, whether a re de Republican or a Democrat, makes an appointment to the federal bench, this prospective judge or justice will claim that if placed on the court, he or she will interpret the legal text as originally understood. This is why when Elena Kagan, for example, was nominated in 2009 by President Obama to our nation's highest court, she said in response to a question in a form given to her by the Senate Judiciary Committee, quote, there's no federal constitutional right to same-sex marriage, unquote. However, in 2005, Justice Kagan found such a right. Even Justice Stephen Breyer, who does not identify as an originalist, nevertheless argues that the Constitution does not require originalism which means that he appeals to the document's original meaning as he understands it in order to reject originalism. His argument is actually quite a sophisticated argument that there's a sense in which the Constitution, uh, as authored by the founders, wasn't ever intended to be read in an originalist fashion. Uh, the late Ronald Dworkin held a very similar, a similar view. Even though originalism is in a much better place in the popular culture, and the law schools than it was 50 years ago, and even though the presence of conservative judges and justices spread throughout the federal judiciary has forced non-originalists to wrestle with their arguments and to craft opinions that sound originalist, the politicizing of the courts has been ratcheted up significantly. A prospective jurist's judicial philosophy and its implication for a specific set of issues dealing uh, with abortion, religion, race relations, and political speech is now almost the exclusive focus of presidential appointments to the federal bench. In fact, uh, when Judge uh, Gorsuch uh, is uh, interviewed, when he testifies for the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, he will be asked these questions and he will answer them, I assure you, in this way. I can't answer this question uh, because a case similar to this may come up before the court. Now, if I were asking him a question or, let's say, an appointee by a more liberal um, or a more liberal appointee by, a, by, let's say, a Democratic president, I would, I would pick cases that are already settled from the 19th century. I would ask questions like, well, what do you think about Dred Scott? <laughs> I mean, I think, I think those kind of opinions actually and say, well, what makes that opinion wrong, right? And that, that I think, in a sense... I mean, they can't say, well, we're going to have that, some case like that's going to come before the court, right? Uh, it seems to me those are the kind of questions would be more interesting to ask. That is, not, not the sort of obvious gotcha questions, but the kind of questions that kind of draw out the reasoning of the justice. Cases that, as I said, are, are, are considered settled in the distant past. Um, the irony of originalism's success is that it has allowed non-originalist political figures to imply on, a one, on the one hand, that some form of originalism is essential to a properly functioning judiciary, while on the other hand, explicitly promising their supporters that they will only appoint judges and justices who will follow specific policy prescriptions that at one time in our nation's history had been decided by the states and or our federal government's political branches. Uh, both, both sides do this. Uh, when uh, Trump was running for president, he promised justices that uh, would overturn Roe v. Wade. So it's clear that that both sides do this. Uh, and in some ways, that speaks to the, to the success of originalism, the fact that these issues are up front and center and that people use the vocabulary of originalism even uh, when rejecting it. A uh, second type of conservatism that has arisen over the past 50 years is economic conservatism. Economic conservatism is a response, uh, in some ways, to the rise of the welfare state and the incremental increasing of taxation, which, as many have argued, results 
in diminished economic growth and a mounting permanent underclass in American society. That's the kind of argument that one heard mostly, by the way, in the late 60s through the 70s uh, and to the ascendancy of Ronald Reagan. Um, it has been well document for, documented, for example, that in the U.S. government's now defunct aid to families with dependent children, AFDC, though intended to financially help single mothers below the poverty line, actually resulted in a dramatic increase in out-of-wedlock births. Because the government, according to AFDC critics, was literally paying women for having children out of wedlock, it got what it paid for. But it got more social pathologies and thus more poverty as well. In 1996, President Bill Clinton, a Democrat, in cooperation with the Republican Congress, signed legislation that ended ADFC and replaced it with a program called Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or TANF. Although many critics of President Clinton's welfare reform in 96 predicted dire consequences for the poor, in 2006, the liberal magazine The New Republic pointed out that, quote, a broad consensus now holds that welfare reform was certainly not a disaster and that it may, in fact, have worked much as its designers had hoped, unquote. Given the power of free markets to create wealth, lift people out of poverty, and produce more essential commodities than any other system in the history of the world, economic conservatives are right in touting their views as empirically uh, demonstrable, or at least supported strongly. Yet, as some communitarians and social conservatives have pointed out, the logic of the market without the moral infrastructure and limits of a stable civil society has a tendency to colonize institutions and practices that sustain goods by their, by, that by their very nature cannot be items of consumption. This is precisely where a rift has developed within conservatism uh, between what I call market conservatives and traditional moralists. Market conservatives typically argue that because free markets have been so efficient and successful in producing wealth and prosperity and thus allowing us to enjoy many other goods, the reasoning of the market should be applied to all aspects of life. So, for example, if you read very closely some of the uh, literature that, that came out of, uh, of, of uh, the gentleman Steve Bannon, who is now, um, what's his title in the, for Trump? He's like his chief of staff. Is he chief? Chief, chief strategist, thank you. His work has been, and this was actually quite surprising to me, I, I was not aware of him before uh, the election, as how critical uh, he is of, of free markets uh, for precisely this sort of reason. So you have uh, some of these arguments that uh, in the past were rejected uh, by the Republican Party and, and most conservatives now sort of being embraced by certain factions of, the, of conservatism. Um, so, um, for the, for the, um, um, for the market conservative, uh, because the value of commodities is discovered by calculating the price for which people are willing to pay for them, the value of all apparent goods, including those givens of human nature that, tradi that the traditional moralist believes are objective intrinsic goods and not the product of human will, carry no normative weight whatsoever for the market conservative. As he sees it, these givens, far from being basic truths of human nature on which the common good depends, are constraints on the liberty of each individual to pursue his own subjective vision of the good life. For this reason, for the market conservative, the almost exclusive goal of politics is limited government, by which he means not only a free market economy, but also but the elimination of laws or customs that interfere with the pursuit of the desiring self. Thus, on this account, the common good, if you can call it that, is measured by how unencumbered the individual is from tradition, nature, familial ties, religion, etc., to acquire what he wants and when he wants it. And yet, in practical politics, market conservatives and traditional moralists have often found themselves employing similar vocabulary and arriving at similar conclusions on matters of policy, though their underlying rationales are remarkably different. Like the market conservative, the traditional moralist often advances the cause of quote-unquote limited government. So, for example, both will support free markets, for such an economic system has the best record of raising standards of living. But what's the point of raising standards of living, asks the traditional moralist. For the market conservative, uh, the great end, as C.S. Lewis put it in his book, The Abolition of Man, is to get people fed and clothed. The question of how these citizens conduct their lives is outside the law's jurisdiction as long as their conduct does not interfere with the private choices of their fellow citizens to pursue their own visions of the good life. 
Although the traditional moralist agrees with the market conservative that the acquisition of wealth and being fed and clothed are good things, he views them as worthy of pursuit only because they assist him in advancing the natu his natural duties to spouse, progeny, neighbor, nation, and God. For the traditional moralist, liberty is the freedom to pursue the unchosen goods of ju natural justice unencumbered by certain external agents such as criminals or unjust governments. For the market conservative, liberty is freedom to pursue whatever one desires, unencumbered by any non-chosen obligations to spouse, progeny, neighbor, nation, or God. For the traditional moralist, the good is what is desirable in itself, while for the market conservative, desiring something is what makes that something good. As long as free markets and their moral limits were contextualized within a cultural infrastructure that was not consciously inimical to the goals of the traditional moralist, an alliance between market and moral conservatism made a lot of sense. The traditional moralist had good instrumental reasons to support free markets, while the market conservative had good pragmatic reasons to accept the givens of the wider culture. But that's not the world we live in anymore. Perhaps, as some have noted, the market conservative was never a true friend of the moral conservative. It was just a marriage of convenience that was headed for divorce once one of the parties found a better suitor. Although I think that theory is a bit simplistic, we cannot ignore the place and time at which we find ourselves. Third type of conservatism, foreign policy conservatism. Foreign policy conservatism arises out of the Cold War, seeing communism as intrinsically antithetical to the ideals of American constitutionalism as well as a threat to world peace, foreign policy conservatives maintained that the only way to prevent the spread of communism was, to, was by having a dominant military with overwhelming defense capabilities. Given the stagnant nature of communist economies in the decades following the Second World War, foreign policy conservatives relied on the West's economic growth and prosperity to not only spend the Soviet Union and its allies into oblivion, but to offer an attractive alternative to the subjugated masses trapped behind the Iron Curtain. When the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, it was not Mr. Gorbachev that tore down that wall, as President Reagan had suggested just 18 months earlier at the Brand, uh, excuse me, Brandenburg Gate. Rather, it was the peoples of East and West Berlin. The day before this happened, our own intelligence agencies had no idea that it was going to happen. It's, it's sort of astonishing. Um, I remember that, um, I'll never forget that, that morning where... Um, um, Tom Brokaw, I mean, <laughs> he was at the wall and people were taking pieces of it and I never thought I would live long enough to see that and it just happened overnight. It was astonishing. Um, by the way, if you ever have a chance, um, there's a documentary that was produced, I think by the Discovery Channel several years ago about what happened behind the scenes um, with some of the, uh, the, the what eventually became the uh, uh, former Soviet bloc uh, countries and their presidents, how they were able to negotiate the dissolving of the Soviet Union in a small uh, cabin in the mountains of Georgia, and how they informed Gorbachev of what they had done. It is one of the most astonishing stories, and actually it shows you, uh, that I, I stayed up till 3 a.m. watching it one night, and it shows you that just a few people wanting to change something can actually change something. It, it's an astonishing story. Uh, so what followed? Um, uh, what followed uh, after 1989? What followed for the next decade or so was a vacation from history, which ended on September 11, 2001, with the terrorist attacks in New York City and Washington, D.C. As the world's only superpower, the greatest military in the history of the world, we confidently invaded Afghanistan and then Iraq. With our superior might and technological sophistication, we were promised that victory would be swift the terrorists would quickly share the same fate as Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, and that the draw of Western culture and its freedoms would, like it did in the waning days of the Cold War, result in millions of oppressed peoples resisting their leaders and embracing the principles of liberal democracy and American constitutionalism. Those military adventures, however well-meaning, have not quite turned out that way. Our experiences in World War II and the Cold War, as well as our beliefs about religion, and its place in the polity were so formative and in the way in which we looked at the world, including the Islamic world, that we just couldn't imagine why our way of life did not appeal to every reasonable person on earth. Because the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were initiated by a conservative president, 
Conservatism, rightly or wrongly, has been saddled with the consequences. For this reason, conservatism finds itself today divided over the role the United States should play in the world. But the fact is that given America's economic and military might, a United States that withdraws too much from, the, from world affairs sends the message to bad actors that there will be no consequences for their mischief. The fourth type of conservatism is social conservatism. Social conservatism is the response to changing cultural mores that eventually find their way into law. Uh, the anti-abortion pro-life movement, for example, gained steam after the U.S. Supreme Court hands down Roe v. Wade. Ironically, since that court decision, uh, that movement has had remarkable success in changing many minds on the issue of abortion, even though the courts have upheld very few restrictions on the practice. However, as more libertine beliefs about human sexuality, marriage, uh, gambling, um, pornography and obscenity and so forth have gained mainstream currency in American culture. Social conservatives have not only changed a few minds, they have s slowly over time appropriated these new mores into their own private lives and institutions. Although social conservatism arises as a counter to the sexual revolution, the advocates of which had argued that they just simply wanted to be left alone, Social conservatives now find themselves fighting for the preservation and integrity of their own institutions and religious conscience because their political adversaries will not leave them alone. There has been over the past decade or so a subtle shift from the political liberalism that gave rise to these changes to a kind of hegemonic liberalism that maintains that these changes have, should be normative for all institutions, both private and public. For example, during oral arguments in the case Obergefell v. Hodges, Justice Samuel Alito, relying on the reasoning of the 1983 case, Bob Jones v. the United States, asked U.S. Solicitor General Donald Varelli if private religious colleges would be subject to loss of tax-exempt status if same-sex marriage would be legally recognized as a constitutional right. Uh, General Varelli answered, quote, you know, I don't think I can answer that question without knowing more specifics, but it's certainly going to be an issue. I don't deny that. I don't deny that, Justice Alito. It is. It is going to be an issue, unquote. This, by the way, is the dominant view uh, among many elites in the United States. For instance, University of Chicago philosopher and legal scholar Martha Nussbaum has suggested that the reasoning of the Bob Jones case should apply to Catholic universities that require their presidents to be priests. She believes that because this requirement means that only men can hold these presidencies, because only men can become Catholic priests, this policy is discriminatory and the schools should lose their tax exempt status. As a practical matter, this crusade for liberal hegemony has been most successfully prosecuted in several cases, including proprietors who have run afoul of certain anti-discrimination laws. The most, no, not most well-known cases have concerned a baker in Colorado, a photographer in New Mexico, and a florist in Washington. In each case, the proprietor declined to do business with a same-sex couple who tried to procure their services for a ceremony or event that celebrated the couple's wedding. However, the courts in every case uh, ruled in favor of the complainant couple maintaining that the proprietor, by declining service, discriminated against the customer based on his or her sexual orientation in violation of the jurisdiction's anti-discrimination law. In a concurring opinion in the New Mexico case, Justice, Justice Richard Bosson suggests that religious liberty must sit in the back of the secular bus once those who choose to exercise it enter the marketplace. Quote, the defendants are free to think, to say, to believe as they wish. They may pray to the God of their choice and follow their, those commandments in their personal lives wherever they would lead. The Constitution protects the defendants in that respect and much more, but there is a price, one that we all have to pay somewhere in our civic life. In the smaller, more focused world of the marketplace, of commerce, of public accommodation, the defendants have to channel their conduct, not their beliefs, so as to leave space for other Americans who believe something different. In short, I would say to the defendants with the utmost respect, it is the price of citizenship, uh, unquote. So here one sees the logic of the market, the idea of man, of human beings, as merely homo economicus, one citizenship reducible to the roles of buyer and seller, being employed as a means by which to eliminate from our view what many of us believe is more fundamental to our natures as human beings, our beliefs about those ultimate and permanent things by which our conscience is guided. The future of conservatism. The four types of conservatism we covered, 
this evening, constitutional, economic, foreign policy, and social, have met with differing degrees of success in American politics. I believe, however, the future of conservatism hinges on growing and sustaining those private, non-governmental, subsidiary institutions from which conservative thought most naturally arises. Schools, small businesses, civic organizations, churches, etc. But in order to do that, conservatives have to make it their project to do two things. One, limit the size of the administrative state, and two, offer a principle, offer a principle defense of traditional liberal ideals of freedom of speech and association. As we have seen over the past decade, the most contested questions over individual liberty do not come from specific pieces of legislation, but rather from regulations issued by unelected officials at administrative agencies. Consider the following examples. The problems with the HHS mandate for closely held businesses and religious organizations like the Little Sisters of the Poor did not arise from anything in the text of the Affordable Care Act. Rather, they arose from a letter issued by the HHS secretary as a consequence of powers given to her by the ACA. Essentially, Congress gave her the power to make laws, enforce them, and fine those who violated them. The Departments of Justice and Education can, without the direct approval of America's law-making body, Congress, interpret Title IX so that private institutions receiving any level of federal funding must conform to a particular set of beliefs and practices, even if it is in violation of the institution's long-held mission. The IRS has the power to assess without, whether a nonprofit organization, such as a school or a church, has violated quote unquote public policy and thus should have its nonprofit status revoked. We can, of course, cite other examples from any number of the alphabet agencies that dominate our federal system. But the point is this conservatives ignore at their own peril the growing administrative state and its power to limit and eliminate the institutions by which conservatives have traditionally communicated their ideals to the wider public. This is why conservatives must proceed with caution in offering support for President Trump's executive orders or if he employs the administrative ways that under a progressive president conservatives would recoil in horror. If conservatives really believe rules are more important than outcomes, then that is always true even if you like the outcomes. As we have seen over the past decade or so, traditional liberal understandings of freedom of speech and association have fallen on hard times. With the prevalence and per per pervasiveness of speech codes on public university campuses and the use of private corporations and social media to silence dissent against those who have the temerity to hold unpopular ideas, conservatives should be in the forefront of defending what I like to call rock-ribbed liberalism. It was my daddy's liberalism. Um, I grew up in a family. My parents were old-fashioned FDR Democrats. And um, I was, I didn't meet anybody. I, the first person, I, I don't think I was, till I was 17 that I met anybody who actually disliked Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, so you sort of get, a, that's the kind of family I, I grew up in and it was the sort of the lessons that I learned uh, from my parents. Uh, it, it was the sor sort of liberalism that had champions that said things like this, quote, if all mankind minus one were of one opinion and only one person were of the contrary opinion, mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person than he, if he had the power, would be justified in silencing mankind. That's John St Stuart Mill, um, a great uh, English philosopher who actually served in Parliament. Or this, quote, If there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official higher petty can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. If there are any circumstances which, which permit an exception, they do not now occur to us, unquote. Or even, the, by the way, that was Justice Robert Jackson in 1943 uh, in an opinion where he over, they over, the Supreme Court overturned a statute in West Virginia which required all students to say the Pledge of Allegiance, and there were two Jehovah's Witness students that refused, and they wound up... Uh, winning that case. Or even this, quote, but, but what I am suggesting is this, secularists are wrong when they ask believers to leave their religion at the door before entering into the public square. Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, William Jennings Bryant, Dorothy Day, Martin Luther King Jr., indeed the majority of great reformers in American history were not only motivated by faith but repeatedly used religious language to argue for their cause. So to say that men and women should not inject their personal morality into public policy debates is a practical absurdity. 
Our law is, to, is by definition a codification of morality, much of it grounded in the Judeo-Christian tradition. That was uttered in 2006 by Senator Barack Obama. In the old days, before social media's institutionalizing and tacit approval of the once rightly condemned peer pressure, your parents or your teachers or both would give you some pointers on how to manage your reflexes and navigate your thoughts in a free and open society. I know not everyone's parents were rock lib liberals like mine, but I, I can't help that. Uh, this would usually happen when you complained or whined about hearing, seeing, or reading something that challenged your deeply held beliefs or forced you to think in ways that were uncomfortable and disorienting. So what I want to read to you now is, a, is, is my summary of what I can remember my father telling, to me, telling me when I returned home from elementary school one day and was really bothered by what the teacher was saying in class. And this is, what, this is my interpretation of what he said. Um, it probably sounds more like a 56-year-old philosopher than it does a 35-year-old accountant, which my dad was at the time. Uh, little Francis, assuming that is your name, one of the great things about living in a free and open society is that you have no choice but to understand and learn from those with whom you disagree. This is great for at least four reasons. First, the other guy may have the truth, and by engaging him, you have an opportunity to acquire it. Second, the other guy may not have the truth, and, but by confronting his challenges, you will have learned to better appreciate and understand your own beliefs and what justifies them. Third, you may have the truth, and thus, when the other guy engages you, he has the opportunity to become more intellectually virtuous while making you a better friend because you have assisted him in acquiring the truth. Fourth, neither of you may have the tr full truth, but by dialoguing with each other, you may each have to adjust your beliefs, and as a consequence, you not only draw closer to the truth, you draw closer to each other. This rock ribbed liberalism is being quickly replaced by a faint-hearted liberalism whose advocacy advocacy rejects its core, these core principles, the pursuit of truth and the presumption of liberty, and seek to replace them with the sovereignty of identity and the supreme blessedness of affirmation. For this reason, conservatives must respect the truth more than they do winning. This means that we cannot tolerate in our midst exaggeration, contempt for our opponents, shallowness of thought, and the exercise of power for its own sake. For such habits of mind keep us bound to undisciplined reflexes, which make it not only difficult to find the truth, but nearly impossible to exercise our political liberties with moral clarity and purpose of forethought. It is often said that politics exists downstream from culture. If so, then the future of conservatism cannot lie exclusively in the quality of its ideas and arguments, though that is certainly important. Rather, it lies in the vitality of the institutions from which those ideas and arguments arise. So if conservatism is to flourish and contribute to America's political conversation, its adherents have to find ways to limit the scope of the administrative state, as well as to re-argue the case for the rock-ribbed liberalism that was once taken for granted as essential to American constitutional democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for questions. Sure, yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, so as somebody whose uh, political conscience has kind of been formed and, um, you know, under Bush and Obama and now Trump, you know, I, uh, and I've kind of had to go elsewhere, I think, for true conservatism, you know, books and the like. Books are good. Yeah, books are good. <laughs> <laughs> I write them. <laughs> um, so I see things like the, uh, the freeze on regulations as something that uh, is a step so uh, bolder than any other step I've ever seen a president make towards what I would consider true economic conservatism anyway. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I see I see your argument towards you know um, you know respect for the rules over respect for the outcomes, and, and I'll grant that this is a kind of a, a respect for the outcome of less regulation. Should we be alarmed the fact that he's using his executive power for that when that is in, ex in itself an executive kind of well, there's nothing wrong with executive orders. The, 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 the chief executive of the United States, the president of the United States, uh, is the director of an entire branch of government. And that branch of government has to have policies, right? So you read the Constitution, and the Constitution doesn't give you much detail about how, let's say, the president is to uh, apportion certain amounts of money given to him by um, Congress to run the office of the president. And of course, as the country has developed over over the centuries, um, 
you know, the president has had to uh, issue other sorts of executive orders given, given these laws. So executive orders by themselves are not bad things, right? I've not read this executive order concerning um, a regulation. So there's nothing wrong in principle with it. Um, it and, and, I, and I think that, um, uh, yeah, so um, have presidents used that power uh, too often and uh, Wrongly, of course, all presidents have from both parties. I mean, one of the most famous cases is when Harry Truman used an executive or, or order to, to take over the steel companies in Pennsylvania. Uh, so, I mean, so, the, you know, presidents have done, done that. It's through executive order that we got the internment camps in the Second World War. So, 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 so I'm sorry, I'm going, giving you a long answer, but, but uh, so... Uh, yes, I mean, there's nothing wrong with if it is under the jurisdiction of the executive branch, the president certainly does have the power to uh, tell particular uh, cabinet members to, um, you know, change regulations, yeah. right? I, I mean, my, my question is more like, and I didn't get the chance to articulate it the first time, but um, kind of the boldness we see with Trump and, and the willingness to diverge from tradition, um, I, I would say in some ways, at least in this case, is going to advancing the cause of conservatism, at least that's what the inside Yeah. I, I think it, it comes, for me, it comes down to just uh, what, what is actually the sub substantive content of the executive order. And uh, if, it, if it is, at the end of the day, a way to sort of bypass ordinary avenues of legislation, I think it's a bad idea. Because I think one of the things that a president does uh, anybody that's in a position of leadership is the way in which they act sets an example. It also um, changes the way people think is po about what things are possible. I mean, uh, it, it, you know, you obviously don't remember Ronald Reagan. Um, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. That's my, uh, Reagan, uh, prior, to the, uh, prior to Reagan, I mean, Reagan changed the way people talk about, let's say, economic issues that to a large extent, the economic policies of Bill Clinton didn't differ that much from Ronald Reagan. In fact, I would say that um, even to a, to a certain extent, uh, Barack Obama, his economic policies clearly didn't even come close to returning uh, the country to the sort of ideas that were percolating, let's say, during the New Deal and the Great Society. So, I mean, I, the presidency of Reagan sort of changed the conversation. So presidents, here's my point, presidents, Change, even if they act in ways that you think advance what you want, the very act of doing that sets a precedent for his successors, and they can undo that very quickly. So, yeah. Um, you um, sort of going off on that, you spoke about how one of conservatism's raisings is the regulation from elected officials. Um, do you think, because in many cases where there's regulation from unelected government officials, um, it's sort of due to congressional gridlock or because laws are on the books that need to be interpreted a certain way and the law hasn't caught up. Do you think conservative, uh, conservatism needs to, um, in order to survive, is also dependent on compromise with Democrats in order to be able to eliminate those kinds of situations? A absolutely. I mean, I think the, the whole point of the way our government's put together is so that people can, in fact, talk to each other and negotiate uh, for the purpose of, cer of having certain laws. Um, uh, but the kind of open-end regu regulatory scheme, I think, is highly problematic, partly because of the enormous power that you, that's in the hands of some uh, uh, of, of these regular, I mean, I think so. This is why I mentioned, you know, uh, the the exec the the, the um, uh, Trump's executive orders, and and many of my conservative friends are very, you know, enthusiastic about this. And my thinking is that that's not what I think at the end of the day advances what they believe uh, is in fact the right way for somebody in that position to govern. But yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the old kind of backroom congressionals or the, I don't think they're smoke filled rooms anymore. It's probably against the, the law to have a smoke filled room, right? But, but that kind of like, you know, you'd have this, the, minor, the, the Senate minority majority leader sort of 
talk, and I'm sure they still do that. I mean, that obviously that still occurs, but but I do think that uh, uh, it, it's a lot. Let me put it this way: it's a lot easier for Congress to pass laws that have these general, very vague instructions given to cabinet members and their agencies, and that way they don't take direct responsibility for what they're doing. And so there's a so there's Congress kind of has an incentive not to be too specific. So. Yes, down here yeah. front. Uh, to that point, yes. we've developed a situation where members of Congress spend, in my humble opinion, far too little time dealing with the legislation that they pass and way too much time out raising money. And this is largely, I think, why they have gotten to the point where they have given to the executive broad mm -hmm. concepts rather than specific statutes. Yeah. Yeah, but, I, I think so that's I think Congress can't complain when the president uses executive orders and regulations. But I think we, we're only now beginning to see a little bit where Congress is saying, wait a minute, we have the authority and should have the authority to review the regulations that are being promulgated to flesh out the statutes that we have created. Yeah, now, so, some, be, I think, yeah I mean, some, some of the statutes do, in fact, include in them this kind of oversight. Uh, but yeah, um, I, when I, 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 you know, much of my thinking on this is, was shaped by my, my father, who was an accountant, uh, who are, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't a lawyer, but he argued in several, uh, he had several clients that he, that he, uh, uh, defended in cases before the Internal Revenue Service. So I remember as a kid, my dad talking about, uh, he said, this is a, a, I'm, de I'm defending someone that's being prosecuted by the agency that has the judge and issued the regulation. Yeah. And it's sort of, and that was the thing that sort of kind of stuck in my head. And it's, uh, it sort of has kind of carried into my academic work. So. Should we allow there to be academic, uh, uh, administrative law judges? Yeah. That are within the agencies. That yeah, and I think, uh, you know, I think that's, I mean, I, administrative law is not my expertise, uh, but I think, yeah, the, the guy that's actually written the best on this, at least my judgment, some people uh, disagree with him, is Philip Hamburger at Columbia Law School. He's an administrative law professor who wrote a book on administrative law, came out three or four years ago. Um, I encourage you to, I mean, I encourage you to read it. Also read his critics because it's a, it's a very controversial book, but he, he makes, I think, a very strong case for having sort of um, administ uh, more administrative law judges um, precisely because of this issue. Yes. Yes, I'm just interested to understand, because you said before that presidents can define conversations, which they have in the past, as on what is a conservative and what is a liberal. With that in mind, is Donald Trump a conservative, and if so or not, is he defining what he's being conservative now? Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, you know, I don't know what, I, I only know what he says. I don't know what he believes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, that's why, one of the reasons why I began my talk with the, with the whole deplorable bitter clinger thing, I think that there's an, uh, an element of the American public um, that, you know, doesn't find, um, you know, Trump as a, as a person particularly attractive. But the fact that he has this kind of, I'm not going, he's like the honey badger, right? You know, have, have you seen the video on YouTube, honey badger? I, I can't recite the words to you, but it's about this, this guy did this, it, he's had 80 million hits or something, or some outrageous amount. And, and, and it, it doesn't matter what attacks the honey, honey badger, it still continues on and on, right? It's like the Energizer bunny, if you want to use another uh, metaphor. And I think people, and the fact that he, that he says these, these things that seem so outrageous, I do think it's, it's also a, a people find the whole idea of sort of politically correct language so troubling that they say, oh, it's about time somebody said. So I do think there's that that's going on. But as far as his own personal political, does he have a personal political philosophy? I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, he was a registered Democrat for a long time. Uh, so... Uh, so yes. Yeah, so I understand what you were talking about and the four areas that you defined as comprising conservative ideology and the different directions and tacks it can take. But will you concede that 
in the political realm, none of those can be advanced. None of those have been advanced. There is no Barry Goldwaters emerging. Yeah. The people that have been sent to Congress as Tea Party conservatives who were supposed to do conservative work <laughs> didn't do it. And what's actually happening is that in the political realm, you have a culture war that's being waged politically. The conservatism continues to lose, and they're losing badly. And so the, the, the notion I have, well, first of all, I'm, I'm wondering if you'll concede that point. And oh, I, I, I think there's differing degrees of success. So I do think, um, I think, I think economic conservatism um, has largely emerged victorious in terms of its, I mean, as a general understanding of the, the importance. Because he, he, he uh, Barack Obama failed for eight years, but you would be hard pressed to get someone on the left half of the aisle to concede that point. I mean, they just readjusted the numbers down for the last quarter for 2016. But my point is that it's an echo. We're, all, we're only talking to ourselves, and we're not reaching people who we need to convert to carry the torch forward on why conservatism is superior to progressivism. And I, I do think that the bitter clingers were onto something. And I think what they were voting for was a defense of core beliefs that they feel have been ignored. I, I, don't, I don't disagree. I mean, I, that's why I began, began with that. I think that there was a kind of visceral intuition that people had and that they gravitated to Trump for that reason. I mean, I do think, for example, I mean, it's sort of astonishing to me was that 80% of all American evangelicals voted for Trump. And that was largely driven by two factors, I think, fear and the judiciary. So uh, one of the things that, you know, in the, in, uh, the, in the evangelical world, um, the idea, w w when, when um, Varelli responded to Alito's question in that way, evangelicals in, in their world, in their publications, immediately thought, well, when are they going to go after our schools and our colleges and our institutions? So I know many evangelicals who voted for Trump who can't, couldn't stand him, but they, but they really feared that a Clinton administration would just sick the federal administrative agencies on their institutions. And uh, so, I mean, I actually think that if, I think Hillary Clinton, if she had said, let's say two weeks before the election and directly addressed this question, that she would have picked off about 5% to 10% of the evangelicals and would have won. I think it was, I think it was, I think it was, well, I think it was that close. Obviously, it was that close in terms of the states in which uh, Trump um, put, put Trump over. But, but yeah, I mean, I think that, that uh, this is why um, uh, I, I think when, when, we, when we talk about, um, uh, you know, people that uh, very, were strongly supportive of Trump, um, I, 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 tried, I, I try to be careful in not sort of denigrating or saying things in ways that, uh, diminish uh, their interest or uh, their, I think, legitimate fears and concerns. So, um, but that's why I, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, if you're talking about advancing conservatism, I think this is why the institutions are the most important thing. Right, but, yeah. but it, the institutions are only important to the extent that they're preserved. Yeah. And according to a lot of people, the red states, the flyover states, they, they didn't feel like anybody was doing that. And I, I, I do think he's, a, he's an arrow in the quiver in, in what is going to be a very, very long war. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, if conservatism is successful in the future, what do you see America like 10 years from now when my grandchildren are done adults? I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, it depends how you measure success, right? So, um, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, uh, if, if conservatism is successful, um, I think you, you would obviously see a different, I think it would, it, 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 I think you'd first see it in the, in, in the way in which, let's say, courts interpret laws. Um, I think, so in terms of, let's say, economic, um, and judicial conservatism, I think you, you, that's where I think you'd see the, the, the initial 
success. I do think, though, in terms of um, uh, conservatism, con social conservatism, I don't see social conservatism um, having that much success, except perhaps, let's say, on the issue of abortion. Um, I think in terms of the culture war, in terms of those issues, I think the progressives have largely won. I think the best thing that conservatives can hope for is the preservation and protection of their own institutions and to uh, nurture and care for those within their communities. But I don't, I don't, I, that, so that's my, that's my sense of things. So, and, and that may at the end of the day be, um, maybe it's better. You know, I don't know. Well, I'm driven to this question by trying to understand how our diverse society can learn to live with each other. I mean, human yes. beings are very tribal, and we have all mm -hmm. kinds of, loosely speaking, tribes in the United States, religious, ethnic, uh, cultural, and so forth. And if conservatism is going to be successful, it needs to find a way to get people to at least live with each other, yeah. at least accept uh, different, different views in a yeah, I, I think it's a it's, it's a ver, very good point. I, I I'll, I'll confess to you that I that that you know I, I, one of the things that that I've discovered myself doing, and I've tried to rid myself of this habit, is I I tended for several months, maybe a couple of years ago, I found myself all of a sudden just reading uh, online publications that happen to always align with my point of view, N you know, news agency, you know, different, uh, uh, different websites and magazines and different. And what happens in that, you get in this sort of epistemic closure, right? So, uh, and what also happens is that a lot of these websites and blogs know that they increase uh, uh, traffic by being more provocative, right? So what, so the weird thing that occurs is that not only uh, do you find more incendiary language on the sites uh, that you like? It becomes more difficult to go read the other people that you disagree with because you don't actually get to the core of the argument. You have to put up with all the name calling before you. So I mean, I do think one of the things that that would you know, and it may it may not you know be um, very marketable is to you know take our time in sort of not doing that. <laughs> You know, and it, it's difficult. And as I said, I, I found myself several months ago just said, what am I doing? Um, so I was asked by one of my students, oh, what do you read every morning? And I went to my browser and I thought, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not very good at, at reading, you know. Now I am. I am I'm a lot better. <laughs> so. Yes. In order for conservatism to advance, what changes would you make in what has happened in the last year? Well, what I will first off, if um, I I would have advised President Trump uh, in terms of the, I think the most obviously the most controversial thing he's done is the executive order concerning extreme vetting and immigration. I would have done what, what I suggested at the beginning of the talk. I would have, uh, I would have told him, um, you know, you've got to meet with the heads of these agencies, talk to them, what, what, what are the facts on the ground? Now, he had promised during the election, see, and this is where I think his, he's relying on instincts that, that, that worked for him in the election, right? So what worked in the election? You know, saying provocative and outrageous things and then walking it back, right? Uh, and so, but the problem is when you're governing and you're issuing executive orders, it's a lot more serious than that. And what I, I think he should have done, uh, I think he could have issued an executive order that was very similar to this one, uh, but he could have, let's say, had a national address or sat down with an inter be interviewed by somebody in the media where he explained, okay, and sitting next to him, let's say, would be uh, the head of um, Homeland Security, right? And he, he could have said, okay, this is why we're doing it. I'm going to explain carefully. And that would have given, and, and it's only going to be uh, in effect in a week, and this will give people time. That would have done, now, people would have been upset, surely they would have been upset, but that would have been a much more, I think, uh, presidential way to have, have done it, you know. 
that's that's my you know. Yes, did you did you have a? Yeah, yeah I, I did. So I guess I'm not a conservative, and I'm going to take the green slide on this. I I've been sort of wondering during the election why all these um, self-described conservatives um, who supposedly believe in self-sufficiency and working your way uh, through difficulties and so on lined up behind the idea of restrictions on free trade. Um, and so we really want to know the protections. And then I kind of read this interview with some of them, and it's, I, I think I kind of got it. So, but, I mean, I think apparently some of them thought that if you're ready to do hard work, you know, that's kind of enough. And that seems to be kind of odd. You know, you should be ready to do useful work. If no one has use for your services, the fact that you're ready to work hard, however much work you're ready to do, it's just not good enough. And nobody has any duty, not the government, not anyone, to try to create for you that work that you're ready to do so hard. Um, so I was kind of wondering what you think about that, and also whether you think that maybe the future of conservatism, if conservatism is to succeed, there shouldn't be sort of a shift from this rhetoric of hard work that somehow brings virtue, that somehow supposedly should bring other good things, shouldn't be changed so that, you know, it should really be useful work. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not quite sure, sure what you're asking. I mean, I, I, if you're talking about the, the question of trade, I mean, this is where uh, most conservatives disagreed with Trump. I mean, he very much supported tariffs, and and um, he apparently wants to build this wall <laughs> with uh, tech. So, so, so I, yeah. So I mean, there were people who lost their low-skilled jobs. And they wanted them back, and they are self-described conservatives. And supposedly these people believe in the value of hard work, and probably they are very hard working. But somehow they wanted their old jobs back, even though no one has use for their skills. No one has use for them. Um, and so just being ready to work really hard at this old job that's now, you know, <laughs> Not not necessary anymore. Um, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it's going to spell a very bright future for conservatives. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. I mean, you're, I don't know if this is the, the sort of. I mean, what you're suggesting is that um, people that want uh, protect protectionist policies and yet claim to be con so to keep their jobs that are no longer useful. Um, you know, aren't really conservatives. I mean, and, and I don't know if that's, and that may be, but I, I think I suspect that a lot of the people, sort of, uh, sort of blue collar workers and, and, and others that voted for Trump would not identify as conservatives. I mean, I don't think a lot of them w would. Uh, so did you? Well, I think a lot of them do. Yeah. So my question is, when you talk to your really non-conservative friends, what are some of the ways that you're able to get through and have a productive dialogue where you... Well, I never talk about politics. No, I mean, I, you know, I, uh, I guess I don't know. You know, let me just, I think of, over the years, I mean, I've had, obviously, many friends who don't share my political views. Um, you know, it kind of depends on sort of what, you know, what part of life you know, so my academic friends, my, you know, um, sometimes I've actually, in, in three cases, I've, I've delivered papers at academic conferences and they responded to me. <laughs> so we, we had our sort of exchanges in front of people. Um, but generally, um, uh, you know, they've, I, I don't engage, I don't have conversations with friends um, to, to necessarily convert them. You know, it's like, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I hope they get converted, but that's not, I don't think that's the point of co having conversations with friends. <laughs> you know, I, that's, uh, that's just me. But, uh, but no, I've had, 
Um, you know, over the years, uh, as I said, many friends who, uh, with whom I've had disagreements on political and, and social issues, and um, you know, sometimes in some cases, uh, they've helped me to actually clarify my own views. And to ch I've one one case, I actually changed my mind about something. And um, so, and there have been a f one at least one case of one of another friend of mine, sort of, you know changing his mind but so to say so that sort of thing I mean I you know you don't uh, just that's just you know when you're an academic uh, or I guess in any um, uh, any uh, profession you you know you're going to in encounter engage people who disagree with you and um, I think it's important that you don't make every encounter an argument right I mean the one thing about being a philosopher is you have to worry that the meter isn't always running right you know, it's okay to talk about the Super Bowl once in a while. It doesn't always have to be about epistemology and metaphysics, so right? So, ten minutes, and I have this hand up for a while and a couple more. Oh, years. So let's see how many. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, well, I think one place where conservatism is weak and where it's likely to be more successful moving forward is at the state level. We move that to a little bit more of our arguments over who's discovering federalism and who's more yeah. But I think, from what I read, there's an awful lot of, you know, where there's a lot of innovation taking place at the state level, it's in states led by Republican governors who are introducing real changes. And you can see, even in the response to some of Trump's most recent commandments, there's a lot of response coming from the states That's right. saying that we will do, <clears throat> we will play our role, we, uh, we will defend what we think is right. And I, so I see that if, if, if you look at where, where, where conservatism is going and where it might be. And that, does that go hand in hand with the rejection of the administrative state? It's We're interesting to hear Jerry Brown call conservative. Yeah. Well, yeah. So yeah. So I mean, you think about I was, you know, I was going to mention California. The, the you know I guess there's, there's a movement now to put on the uh, a referendum on the ballot that uh, to so that Californians can vote whether to leave the union. Uh, when when my, when my governor uh, Rick Perry mentioned that six years ago, he was called a neo confederate. <laughs> so I mean, uh, yeah. So um, but I do. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I think you know in terms of uh, the last eight years, uh, you know, re the Republican Party has just be dominated state houses. So uh, it's interesting that, you know, for during the primaries, we had how, how many governors running uh, in the Republican side? You had uh, the governor of Wisconsin, um, Scott Walker. You had Jeb Bush, the former governor of Florida, Chris Christie. And none of them seemed to get traction, right? Um, and I wonder if that has to do with the fact that when you're a good governor, uh, at least in today's day and age, the, the connection to the people in terms of the local uh, issues is, is much different. In other words, it's, 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 a diffi it's very difficult to, to move. Uh, I mean, the last, well, the last one was Bill Clinton, right? He was the last uh, governor, but he was somebody that was always involved with national politics from the moment he left law school. So, Bush. Bush. I'm sorry. That's right, George Bush. <laughs> So that, that's, that, that actually proves my point, that, it's a, that George Bush is also was a governor that, that had sort of already a national profile because of his father. Sorry about that. I skipped a president. Okay, over here. Yes. So. Yes. Uh, I'm, 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 yes. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I say European liberals, and interesting, an American conservative take on what's going on. It's going to be, uh, I wonder what the question is, how much is the appeal of conservatism versus the failure of dissatisfaction with liberalism, progressivism, that has won the elections from a historical perspective. Is it the, the appeal of the conservative ideology that would apply to versus the satisfaction of something else? Do people think it's gone too far in this direction? Let's take it back to the left or the other way around this. So yeah. there's a difference in it. You vote for the appeal of it. My sense, and, and I'm, I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not a demographer, I've, I've not done a lot of, uh, I've done some reading in this area, but, uh, but my sense is that, uh, you know, in, a, in the United States, we have roughly maybe 20, 30 percent on 
each side of the political spectrum that are really ideological, but I think we have, we have a much, oh, that's my, that's my phone. It's my, it's my mom. It's my mom. I have to, so I, it's, uh, you know, I should have answered it. It really, it would have embarrassed her though. She, I, I'm giving a lecture at the University of Colorado. She would have been proud. So, oh, she's, oh, so. Uh, mom? I'm giving a lecture at the University of Colorado. I got to go. Can I call you back? I, I love you. Bye-bye. So, <laughs> so uh, getting back to your question, we have, um, uh, so I, I do think that there's, there's a kind of pragmatism in, 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 among Americans. And so I think you saw it in, um, in the 1990s when um, Bill Clinton was elected and his first two years uh, was very much wanted to move the country to the left. He had the dominant, um, he had the majorities in both houses of Congress, and then there was the 1994 Gingrich rev revolution, changed the composition of, 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 the, ha of the House and the Senate. Um, but it's interesting, even G Gingrich overreached. And so what, what he interpreted, the, re they, the Republicans interpreted that result as a sort of uh, ideological affirmation for a kind of almost libertarianism. And that, and so there was a swing back. And so I do think uh, it's, a, it's a mistake, I think, to read American politics as, as any sort of, any side of really sort of winning. So I mean, it's difficult to believe that in 1964, Barry Goldwater won six, oh, excuse me, <laughs> Lyndon Johnson, Barry Goldwater won 39%, uh, Lyndon Johnson won 61%, and then eight years later, Nixon, 60, it was reversed. And so, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult, um, you know, as we saw in this last election, um, and uh, I, I, most, of, most of my own intuitions about what works is, was, were totally wrong, <laughs> you know, but... Um, okay, still a little bit of time. Yeah, over there. Uh, <clears throat> so with Judge Garish, I guess he sounds like he's very much like uh, Scalia was. Um, if there was a, an additional conservative judge that was placed and then confirmed, you know, remains to be seen, onto the Supreme Court, is there a, an issue, not Roe v. Wade, that you would foresee as being pretty impactful that might shift with that uh, change in balance? Hmm. Um, perhaps some, uh, well, it seemed, I, Think of the, I was going to say the Affordable Care Act case, uh, uh, but that may be rendered moot by um, what may transpire in the next year or two. Uh, but nevertheless, that reasoning that Justice Roberts uses in that case uh, could, because there is a lot in, 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 especially in the disputes between Republicans and Democrats about uh, the range and scope of administrative agencies and their powers. And so it may, it, it, that may be an issue, but it's just not that sexy an issue. So it's not something that it would be very difficult, for example, for, let's say, um, Chuck Schumer, the Senate minority leader, to have a filibuster based on, um, you know, let's stand for a uh, particular view of the administrative state. It, it just w doesn't have the same, but something like if, if let's say, uh, the question ro arose whether gay marriage would be, the issue of marriage would be returned back to the states, or that the Defense of Marriage Act could uh, uh, be now upheld, I think that would animate a lot of, that would be a, 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 a very contested question. I don't think that's, that, that would happen, but that's a question that could arise, especially if there's some case between now and then where, the court, where somebody on the court in dicta, that is, sort of says in passing something that gives the impression that this could be the case. So, uh, yeah, I think, um, I, yeah, that's, that's my sense of things. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, you mentioned that you felt that economic conservatism had won. That seems right. Well, my question is whether that's a stable outcome. Now, when I was a teenager, I grew up in the country outside one of the homes of General Motors. And so you're a manual labor working on the Sunday line, which was hard work. 
time. You're going to have a very good life. You're working. Your wife is not working. There's one family income. You can buy a house. You buy a new car in four or five years. Okay? That's changed radically. Okay? The need for manual labor has gone down radically. Right? And we get more automated assembly plants to start going down more and more. Right? The thing is that both parties, let me quote a president, one of the two first presidents we've had in the last 30 years, he said that what you learn depends upon what you can learn. And that seems absolutely right. So someone asks, what's going to be like for his grandchildren? The answer is, it depends upon how intelligent your grandchildren are. If your grandchildren have average intelligence, they're not going to have a very good life at all, as long as we have this philosophy. Right? As long as it's a free market and labor, right? the well-being of the vast majority of the population is going to go down and down. Right? So the question is, is that really a stable outcome? I think that's a, that's a really good point. Um, I don't know if you're, Charles Murray published a book a couple of years ago, Coming Apart, and um, he, he, he argue, he's argued in that book that what we're getting is a sort of cognitive elite, and at the same time, uh, a, a growing underclass with, who in the past, as you point out, had skills that could easily uh, provide for, for, for their family. And I, I think that's right. I'm not sure it is stable, uh, give, given that. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a good point, especially now if you look at the r research, uh, especially on people under the age of 30, their views on certain economic systems. You have um, the, uh, a spike in, in believing in, 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 in socialism as, a, as, as the correct or ap appropriate uh, way in which a society should deal in its economic matters. So I think you're right. I think maybe the combination of, of a sort of change of mind among young people combined with these social realities. So. There should be a reception outside. I hope you'll stick around and talk to somebody who disagrees with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. I got to call my mom. <laughs> Stop. <laughs>